Thank you very much. Um, as uh, Dr. Titinan said, I'm Phil Calvert. I'm uh, Canada's ambassador to Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos, but not Myanmar. So uh, it's actually a kind of a complex situation because most of my embassy works on Myanmar, but I don't. But I'm not going to explain that today. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm, it's great to see the turnout uh, here, uh, all the, the people interested in what is a very timely topic. Um, I think, uh, if I may, I'd just like to uh, welcome the, the participants uh, on this panel. Uh, Mr. Ong Zhao, founder and editor of Irrawaddy Magazine. Uh, Gwen Robinson, Bangkok Bureau Chief of the Financial Times, and uh, soon to be senior fellow, uh, ISIS Thailand. Dr. Chayan Vahandaputi, Director of Regional Center for Social Science and Sustainable Development from Chiang Mai University. Uh, Zhou Wu, Director of Research Program at Myanmar Development Research Resource Institute. And of course, Dr. Titi Nan, who you know well. And it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, Annette Nicholson, Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Regional Management of Canada's uh, International Development Research Center. The IDRC, I think, is well known uh, in this region and known around the world as a significant contributor to Canada's foreign policy uh, and engaging in uh, development research uh, on everything from agriculture and technology to social policy, helping to promote uh, political and intellectual pluralism, intellectual diversity, evidence-based policy making and democratic dialogue. So we're very happy today to see the IDRC uh, turning its uh, interest to uh, work within uh, Myanmar. I think this is a very positive development and a, a good uh, uh, indication of the direction that uh, research and policy is taking. So uh, the turnout today, as I said, is very good and uh, I think the wealth and expertise, wealth of experience and expertise in this room is uh, will lead to a very productive meeting. It's a really good opportunity to have a, a, a serious multidisciplinary discussion about uh, Myanmar's governance, social and economic development needs and challenges, and the kind of research that's necessary that will help address, support, and uh, move forward Myanmar's reform process and long-term uh, progress as well. I want to take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about uh, what Canada uh, Canada is doing with respect to Myanmar, uh, to Burma as we still call it. Um, we have an active political, and now over the last year, a much more active political and economic uh, relationship that's developing uh, with uh, the country. Although, of course, as with many other of our, of our uh, many countries, and I see many of my colleagues in the room here, it's it's in its uh, early stages. We have had a number of ministerial visits back uh, to. Uh, uh, to Yangon mostly, uh, our, our trade, our foreign minister, our trade minister, parliamentary exchanges, and uh, we've also been providing assistance through CETA, the Canadian International Development Agency, uh, through on, in a couple of ways, humanitarian assistance, and we have uh, as well a, a, a five-year program program in place providing support to Burmese refugees on the Thai-Burma border. Uh, we are right now the third largest uh, bilateral humanitarian assistance donor to uh, Burma. And uh, in March of this year, CETA provided over $4 million to organizations such as the UNHCR, uh, WFP, ICRC, and UNICEF to support their Burma-wide undertakings. So this will uh, respond to those who need help most. And in addition, uh, the IDRC, as I said, is here to discuss programming in uh, in Burma and how that might move forward. Uh, the IDRC, uh, as, as part of this kind of a growing presence of Canada in, in Burma, has uh, developed over the last couple of years a research fellowship starting in 2011 at Chiang Mai University. And the purpose is to fund 10 scholars a year to examine Burma's uh, development processes, policies, and, uh, and priorities. So. We see this as uh, this next stage of this discussion is leading to a next stage which will expand and uh, help move forward the IDRC's uh, presence here. Uh, in addition to that, we are, as I said, I'm not the ambassador to, to uh, Myanmar. We are uh, opening an embassy in Yangon 
Uh, we have a new ambassador, Mr. Mark McDowell, who himself does have expertise in their region and uh, is, a, is a language speaker. He'll be taking up his position in July. Uh, so, so we are, uh, uh, as other countries are doing, uh, making, uh, expanding our presence in the region and expanding our engagement with uh, Burma. We're really much, very much looking forward to this and to seeing what can be done as a, in, in cooperation, not only with our like-minded partners, but also with agencies like the IDRC. We know that Burma's ongoing transition has not been without its difficulties, and we're seeing, of course, uh, daily media reports of some of the challenges that it faces. Uh, it, one of the many challenges it faces is organizing its government so that as many ethnic communities have a voice and participate in governance and feel protected. In the last year, we've seen very worrying violence uh, erupting, and it's particularly uh, concerning is the anti-Muslim movement that seems to be gaining momentum. The fault lines in this country are complex, historically rooted, and so when we engage uh, with Burma, when we engage, whether it's for diplomatic reasons, whether it's for development reasons, this has to be a thoughtful and well-informed process. So uh, this is why these kinds of discussions are so very important, uh, 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 such as the ones we're having today and consulting the experts that we have on this panel, the people in the room, is going to be a very important part of the, the policy development that takes place. In addition to, of course, to the, uh, the issue of ethnicity, uh, other issues that make it very, uh, relations very complex, other issues that, uh, that uh, Burma faces include addressing issues related to the role of the military and the government, infrastructure, land rights, labor refugees, uh, all of this is, is makes this a very complex undertaking. So I'm looking forward to the exchange of ideas today to see how uh, how we uh, address both what's happening now, but how we address this in a way that we can challenge this information, channel this information in a way that provides the best kind of uh, basis for uh, organizations like the IDRSG to organize and advance their work. We will, of course, uh, as we establish stronger relations and more uh, broad relations with uh, Burma, continue to uh, recognize that there have been positive steps in the country over the last few years. We'll continue to urge uh, more progress on reforms, to monitor issues such as the treatment of minorities in the country. In that respect, we think Canada has something to offer. Uh, as a multi-ethnic country ourselves and as a government that has made in its past tremendous mistakes in our own treatment of our own minorities and we're and a country that is now facing the reality that some of these mistakes we made in treatment of our for example our first nations people continue to reverberate through our society uh, today so we hope that in our as we engage with uh, burma we can help show that our own experiences, uh, what has happened from our own experiences and how we can avoid some of these mistakes. So this is going to be a really good discussion this morning. Uh, I, I hope we can help people make positive and well-informed choices. I'm looking forward to the discussion and to a very interesting morning. Thank you. Now let me proceed to, to our speakers. Uh, I'm pleased to report that all of them have traveled to get here which means that they're not sitting around in Bangkok analyzing Myanmar. Uh, Ong Zhao has just uh, come from Chiang Mai uh, last night, Jan uh, Yan Watanaputi as well. Uh, Zhao Wu just came from Nepido, Yangon, and Bangkok just for the day. And um, Gwen Robertson has just returned um, from days uh, in, in Myanmar and going back there again, to, I think, next week. Let me begin this way. Uh, our first speaker is Ong Zhao. And Ong Zhao is an old friend. Uh, we managed to have him speak about once a year, you know, depending on how, what kind of sponsorship we can get. And uh, I've noticed that over the years, his uh, views have been much more dynamic. It used to be more static. Uh, in, in the days before this reform process, uh, there was not much to say. I mean, you had a military dictatorship that did a lot of bad things, uh, and it's almost a set piece that you uh, would attack or criticize uh, the various policies and measures of the uh, SPDC. 
But in the last couple of years, things have really changed. I mean, Myanmar is all the rage. There's a stampede. You know, in economics, we call it always shooting. You just you shut, isolated, and now everyone is going in. Uh, Ong Zha is uniquely positioned uh, in a rare perspective uh, to, to see the changes that we have seen. Uh, I want to ask him two things, you know, just from your last visit, I think you've been back five times, six times, a number of times. Uh, what has been your experience? There have been a lot of changes that the uh, number of political prisoners have been freed, thousands. Uh, economic policy reforms have taken place, investment laws have been changed. Uh, the media is much uh, more uh, free now, there's more media freedom. Not enough for some uh, welcome changes for others. Uh, in your experience, what are the reform challenges? And uh, working as a journalist, founder of Irrawaddy, with you, all your contacts and work, uh, what are the obstacles to, to doing journalism, media work, uh, research in, uh, in Burma, Myanmar? Hong Zhao. Uh, thank you, Kantitina. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, I, I would like to uh, say that I'm happy to be back here again. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Uh, I'm, I'm, after I came here, decided to come here, it's a research. So I was thinking of gathering my thought, what should I say? And I'm just, when I was walking here, and uh, I'm thinking to have a, to set up a foundation called the Myanmar Research Investigative Center. We we'll call it MRIC because there is one area we need to make a research, which is where are the billions of dollars being disappeared from Burma? And where are the money all gone to, or somewhere in this with banks in Singapore or somewhere? That is question that uh, I think a lot of people inside the country want to know. Over the last 24 years, one of the uh, resource-rich countries in Southeast Asia, all the resources being being sold to China and the neighboring countries. The handful of people being a filthy rich in our country, where are the, all the money gone? I think this is maybe one of the research that we have we should have done at the start from now. So that's a joke, okay? <laughs> so you know how to measure how to measure the uh, our changes in Burma, which is which is quite quite interesting. If you if if since the last year, you know. After 24 years living in Thailand and other countries, I'm being able to go back to Burma. And I, people ask me, how do you measure? How do you embrace the, uh, these, these, these positive changes? And there are still a lot of challenges and risks that stay there. And uh, the first time I applied for a visa, and I got a five days visa to enter my own country. So I thought it was very, it was very tiny uh, amount of uh, uh, day to spend in my own country, which I haven't been there back to for for 24 years. The second time when I applied for a visa, they gave me a one week visa, and third time they gave me 10 days, and fourth time they gave me two weeks visa, and and which I see as a this is a change, it's a positive change is taking place in our country. And last week I applied for a visa. Journalist visa, I got a multiple three months entry. So, this alone would indicate that there are a lot of changes and reform may have been taking place in, in, in the country. But as a journalist, there are a lot of challenges and a lot of risk uh, inside the country. We had opened a bureau inside the country, and because of our coverage on the uh, this ongoing sectarian violence and then the the the, uh, the against Muslim minority or Rohingya minority in our country, uh, we come under fire from the different elements inside and outside the country. Is there's a huge risk for us to keep covering even the last two days ago, there has been a, a new violence taking place in, in Lashio in northeastern Shan states. And uh, a journalist has been attacked, and our journalist 
uh, arrived yesterday, and today they will be doing reporting. We don't know what will be the, the obstacle that they will be facing. At the same time, the Ministry of Information remain in charge. A lot of Western governments or Western media would like to praise Burma's reform taking place. There is no more censorship, which I don't believe it. I think there is a censorship is still there. And uh, there are regulations, uh, there are policy, uh, they, are, they still control the uh, publishing license, and we have to renew. Even though we were issued a publishing license, we were given only six months. And every six months, you have to renew your license. If they don't like what you report, and then they can revoke and they can stop giving you a, a renewing a license to you. So there are a lot of challenges for uh, in, in, even in, a, in the media sector. Plus, a lot of giant media. Some may be very upset to hear that, but I think a lot of giant media inside the country are owned by family members of the military leaders, and they have their own agenda. So, if you have a, if you are small, but you are mighty, uh, if you are independent-minded, if you keep reporting on, if you keep reporting on a lot of important issues inside the country, you are going to be sidelined. So that, that's the one thing I think uh, I, I find is very difficult. Uh, in spite of the relaxation of the censorship inside the country, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, self-censorship inside the country. So even covering on the uh, Rohingya issue and then this violence uh, in, in Burma. A lot of media are uh, very much nationalistic and um, very much anti-Muslim and uh, a lot of mainstream media are uh, owned by the uh, rich, filthy rich uh, military uh, family members and uh, they, they, they are really uh, fun in the flame of the nationalism and uh, going after the Muslims and uh, the minority. So I think this is this is the area that uh, I find it is very very disturbing to uh, to see that uh, that that when we talk about changes, I have a strong cautious uh, uh, optimism or strong uh, reservation, and also Ministry of Information. I wonder if if Burma is going to go forward the uh, a, a free and a democratic society. The question is, I want to ask to myself and all of you and anyone that I want to ask is that. Do we still need a Ministry of Information in our country? I mean, why do we still need a Ministry of Information? I think one day, I think we should, Burma should dismantle Ministry of Information. We no longer need a Ministry of Information. Why do we have to spend a lot of money for this Ministry of Information? So I think each ministry can have their own information department and spokesman and they can issue and release a statement and hold a press conference as they like. So I, this is also one of the issues that we have faced because the Big Brother, we feel that they've been watching and, and also it is also a kind of a military attitude and because of each ministry are run by the former military officer and they don't want to leave the position. So they feel like they're guardian of the nation. They're guardian of, of the whole country. And they own it. So to, whenever there's an issue on a censorship or a media law or whatever you name it, uh, they have to get, get involved and uh, say something and they have to draft a law. They have to pass a law uh, without any consultation, without any input from the uh, uh, media Practitioner. So this is just one of the challenges we have been facing inside the country. Unless you are count on to your their policy and then they are, I mean, they, the, what they have been preaching, then uh, they are they are pleased with this. Otherwise, they they are they are not very happy with what we have been reporting on on Burma or Myanmar. So I think in terms of research and the development, I mean, you can see. The last 24 years, both government, the regime, and the opposition have done a lot of research about ethnic violence, rape cases, and the economy, and poverty. 
and HIV AIDS and health and education. But a lot of data is uh, very much biased and, and one-sided and politically driven, a lot of data is. Uh, and today, again, after the reform taking place in our country, we see President Tain saying, talking about to reduce the poverty. I think December 20, 2012, he said 25% to 60% by 2015, he pledged to, you know, citing the UN Millennium Goal. And again, in May 2030, he talked about investment to be increased by fivefold between 2012 and 2013. I don't know where he got all the data from. You know, so, so I, think, I think this is also another, another spinning, I think, is started. So that's why the independent and impartial research is so important because of, if you want to treat a baby tiger called by the former Assistant Secretary of State, uh, Kurt Campbell, I mean, it's very sick baby tiger. I think you have to give a very rightful, I think, uh, uh, prescription to a baby tiger. Otherwise, I think if you are going to give a wrong prescription to a wrong policy of the baby tiger, I think it, 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 will, it will gone. It will be gone. So I think, I think it's so important for all of us that what kind of uh, area uh, we are looking at. We go identifying the areas, ethnic violence, poverty, health and education, the media and development area. All these areas are so important for all of us to have an impartial and independent research. And then we have to start to train and have a technique, the, our food soldiers, to have a, a right policy research so, research so that you can have a I think uh, you can clearly uh, give a, a proper guideline to this this very fragile I think uh, reform taking place in our country. Thank you very much. You've pointed to the uh, importance of data uh, and I think I'll come to Gwen Robinson now. Uh, if you've read the uh, Financial Times in the last couple of years, you'll know that uh, Gwen Robinson has written uh, numerous stories probing all sorts of angles uh, in the ongoing reforms in Myanmar. She has done a lot of field work. She's now almost based there. Uh, she will soon uh, be part-time, not full-time, with the Financial Times in order to write a book on contemporary Myanmar. Uh, during that process, she'll be based uh, with us at, at ISIS Thailand as a senior fellow. Uh, so, Gwen, uh, the, the, what you've seen on the ground and how might uh, that uh, impinge on, on development and research? Thanks. First, uh, I'd just like to say thanks um, um, for having me and also getting this together. It's also fabulous to see so we'll be able to dash over from Napidor. Anyway, I'd, I'd like to focus broadly on the, on the issue of uh, research for not just development uh, organisations and aid, but also our experiences as journalists um, and what we've observed about uh, the information flows uh, about and inside uh, Myanmar. First, um, <coughs> what we've seen is an extraordinary um, switch from a, an absolute dearth of data or unreliable misleading data to an explosion of data, too much possibly. Um, and uh, from conversations with aid organisations and development institutes on the ground in Myanmar, you build a picture of how in the 80s and 90s they were operating often in, in secrecy. It was very difficult to get permission to even do research. If you could get permission, uh, for example, big, big IFIs and uh, uh, organisations such as the United Nations or um, World Bank, um, others who were doing technical support in the 90s uh, often took uh, months or six months to get permission to do research but NGOs might have to wait a year or two. Even then they had to take uh, government officials with them into the field from the relevant ministries. They felt very inhibited about uh, the kind of research they were doing. There were huge constraints on, on the kind of areas. Um, I had a very interesting conversation the other day with someone who was with an NGO in the 90s and early 2000s who were doing uh, work on HIV, uh, AIDS, malaria. Um, very sensitive, uh, a lot of it was done in secrecy. When these organisations uh, 
completed research or had a report, uh, this was also kept very secret. They lived in fear that it would be leaked, um, sorry, Yong Zhu, to the exile media who would then write about it. Um, that would get them into trouble, that uh, people went to jail for leaking um, a data, like a simple development report on maybe local village uh, economy could land people in trouble if it was given out unauthorised. Um, obviously journalists <coughs> journalists were under the as similar constraints. So um, these days with the new atmosphere of openness and despite all the setbacks there is uh, an extraordinary freedom now um, and uh, every aid agency from grassroots up to top levels uh, um, have noted the new freedoms to conduct things the way they want. But that's brought its own problems, which is, uh, first of all, uh, huge time pressures on people. There's a sense of urgency, so things are being done hastily. The money is there, they want to get programs in, uh, they've got to get up some policies, implement it quickly, um, and yet the system is still old. The data is old if you're using government data. It's um, difficult to operate in there. It might take a year to properly get a picture of some rural uh, area that you want to put programs in, but you need to get that program up and running in the next six months. So you've got a lot of intense um, field work being done and uh, programs being cobbled together hastily. Uh, the time pressures are... Uh, are immense on both sides. So um, some aid consultants have told me that they're very afraid to say no to the government when they're asked for something because everybody is trying to establish a relationship. They don't want to reject anything the government wants. On the same, by the same token, the government, uh, in conversations I've had, um, so we might be able to throw some more light on this, says they're very afraid to reject any kind of help. So what you're seeing now developing, I think, is a lot of overlap in certain key areas. Uh, I spoke to a couple of other consultants who said, for example, in health, healthcare power generation, there is um, there are so many programs in every level of agency uh, that now it has started debate uh, in some of the key ministries about. Uh, about possibly establishing a central coordinating mechanism, which surprisingly does not exist at this point. It has to be top down. There should be some kind of central group that can um, that can have a grasp on everything from grassroots up right up to the top, and maybe direct and channel aid flows and proposals. Um, so that would be a very good thing to see, and uh, it would go some way to addressing what uh, what could. Um, very quickly become a, a kind of confused and possibly counterproductive situation if you've got too many agencies clumping together in one one sector. Um, the other thing, the other thing I would say is that um, you've got uh, you've got uh, a lot of reports coming out now with recommendations uh, that uh, I suppose. You're all well aware of how many conferences there are these days on on Myanmar. The, the mother of them all is next week, the World Economic Forum, which will focus on every aspect of Myanmar you wanted to and never wanted to know about. Um, and there's reports coming out every day. So I think, again, on both sides, the government and non-government, there's some um, possibly confusion and uh, appetite to get some sense of what you can and can't trust. Every second organisation is putting out a Myanmar report and as a journalist it also becomes, um, I'm sure my colleagues in this room would agree that it's uh, charting your way through the um, welter of recommendations and reports is, uh, is uh, can, can become quite confusing. Um, so that would be uh, I think that's a, another very big challenge. Um, and finally, I would just say that uh, that for um, the big organisations, uh, I think the the next the next big phase for uh, organisations such as the World Bank, ADB, UN, is to um, 
maybe have more donor coordination between themselves and share research because that's the other area where in this increasingly competitive environment you're seeing um, data jealously guarded sometimes and also some um, some feelings about uh, proprietary aid ideas and programs. There's a hunger to sort of establish some kind of new and innovative program. I spoke to someone the other day at a, a big international organization that's put a program in place now in Rakhine State, um, monitoring six villages, three of them Muslim, three of them anti-Muslim, I mean not anti-Muslim, sorry, non-Muslim, and uh, just surveying how how they're working, how what the potential is for them to work together. Uh, that's quite a political thing, it, it, un, inconceivable a few years ago. Um, but that is being kept very, very quiet. Uh, I don't know when the results of something like that would come out, um, but uh, we would hope that some of the more interesting findings will be shared eventually. Um, so, um, I would say that applies to aid organisations. I think it'll be a long time before you see media sharing their special insights with each other. But anyway, that's, I'd like to leave it at that. There are a lot of similarities between Myanmar, analysing, looking at Myanmar, researching Myanmar, and southern Thailand, for example. You know, I think a lot of analysts and researchers, we're looking for the holy grail. You know, the, the, the one program that's going to develop Myanmar, the, the analysis based on this uh, key data that no one else has. Uh, so, but Myanmar is sexier. It's the last frontier, it's much more exotic. Uh, we're sick and tired of uh, researching the, the Thai South. Uh, we've had a lot of studies and, and so on, it has not gone anywhere. So I think that we're in this phase now, uh, and I don't know if Ong Zhao and uh, Zhao Wu will share this view, that you know the early phase of uh, getting in and just getting a feel for the lay of the land and uh, getting the analysis, uh, the data, and then finally, ultimately, the prescriptions. Uh, it's an ongoing process, but many obstacles, the, the problem that we have seems to me it's been isolated for a long time, right? So you open up and you have the legacy issue, which means that you have a bureaucracy that was really a military bureaucracy and now open to civilian rule. And bureaucracy is very important. Thailand took a long time to build up a bureaucracy as inept and as inefficient as it is. Um, now let me come to uh, Jan Chiyan, who, who uh, has a Thai view uh, based on Thailand's development research uh, experience, uh, and he has a PowerPoint presentation. Thailand is, has a lot at stake uh, in Myanmar, apart from Tawai and all of that uh, uh, schemes and development uh, and so on. We also have a lot of uh, shared history, uh, perhaps even common destiny. And Thailand has been where Myanmar uh, is at uh, in the past. We had military dictatorship before. So perhaps uh, Dan Xian could shed a bit of light on the, the Thai experience and what uh, that might impart on Myanmar's reforms. Thank you, Dr. Titanen, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak about uh, development research in Myanmar. In fact, I not only flew from Chiang Mai last night, but I flew from Yangon two days ago. I will not, because of the time limitation, I will not speak about the Thai experience in development research, but I would like to begin by referring to the, uh, <clears throat> what is known as the international Institute of International Education Report, which is uh, which came out in April, April uh, 2013. The report, which is uh, uh, is about a visit <coughs> by the uh, ten American university, assess the uh, institutional capacity of the university in Myanmar, and it came up with a, a very bleak picture of the future, the, the, the education, the higher education in Myanmar. There are a few uh, issues that I would like to, to raise here. Uh, for example, it mentioned about the lack of social capital, limited 
in institutional capacity, uh, lack of capacity to build international ties, uh, highly centralized but fra fragmented and specific lack of and specific lack of autonomy and choice, uh, absence of certain disciplines, for example, political science, or underdeveloped disciplines, for example, in social science, sociology, journalism. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, some curriculum is to the curriculum is outdated. Uh, <clears throat> But in, in conclusion, I think it is uh, interesting to, <clears throat> to uh, the, 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 the report uh, made a very interesting conclusion. I will read it loud for you. It needs, the needs of higher education in Myanmar are extensive. The entire system requires nothing less than a complete renovation from the physical infrastructure to the academic curriculum. Due to the nature of the capital environment, or, or the political environment over the last two plus decades, and its deleterious, deleterious uh, impact on the education system, university in Myanmar lack intellectual vitality and, uh, <clears throat> and scholarly vibrancies so often associated with Western education institution and most of their and most of their ASEAN country. It is hard to imagine that Myanmar's higher education system once stood out as one of the exemplars across the entire Asian region. So it was when we read uh, this EI uh, IE report we one may feel that it's a little, a little bit less hope to see how research, particularly the development research, can be encouraged and can be developed there. The recommendation of this report is very much about uh, staff exchange and use personal con connection between professors from American University and uh, professors or lecturers from Myanmar universities. So that, that not much being can be done from in terms of uh, development research. The EIA recommend that basic research should be promoted. But I think the EIA, IIE report uh, confined its analysis and, and assessment within the higher education institution only. I found out that uh, it did not mention, it doesn't mention the research activity carried out by other gov government research institutes, which uh, so who has mentioned. Of course, I'm not talking about the military study, right? But <clears throat> here, there are some uh, important uh, research institute, namely Forest Research Institute, uh, which was set up in 1960s. Uh, associated with the uh, uh, university which teach forestry. Medical Research Institute, or called MRI, and Agricultural Research Institute, and of course, the recently founded one, uh, MDRI, which so is going to talk about. <clears throat> but there are some problems with this uh, research institute. Medical Research Institute has been, is very much uh, uh, isolated. Uh, lack of research in certain fields, uh, and interestingly, the <clears throat> medical research, the the, the uh, medical medical school. There are five medical schools in Myanmar now. The the medical research institute, uh, the medical school in uh, in Myanmar can produce 1,500 doctors each year. And only uh, 400 to 500 can be absorbed within the public uh, hospitals. The rest, 1,000 of them, either go to work overseas, most of them work as nurse, or 
working with NGOs in the last four or five years, and some of them now, and, and a lot of them become general practitioners working in urban areas in Myanmar. So it, mean, it means that you train a lot of uh, uh, medical doctors who are capable of doing research in public health or uh, 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 health behavior, but they are, they are not interested in or they have not been encouraged to do research on this. For the uh, Forest Research Institute, the director of this research institute uh, told my, my former student, who is his friend, that each year they produce about 150, but uh, the, 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 I mean the, the, uh, the University of Forestry can produce 150 graduates each year, but only a few, maybe not less than 20 of them can be absorbed by the system. And more importantly, uh, this particular research institute has only one car for the whole, the whole department. Uh, <clears throat> why is it's become like that? Because in the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, as I was told, people would, would, who have degree in forestry tend to work, would like, would prefer to work in the, the, uh, the department which is responsible for forest management or national park management because, because they can be promoted up to the director general. Whereas if they come to the research institute, They'll, be re they'll remain as researchers all the time. So these researchers from the FRI tend to move from FRI to the regular departments within the Ministry of So that the, that's why the FRI has become a very weak research institute. The, another one is called Agricultural Research Institute. I was told that this is act more active and one of the fellow from the from the uh, uh, from uh, the, the one who one of their researchers received a fellowship from uh, <coughs> IDRC uh, grant, which uh, Chima University is implementing. That. Of course, there has been recently established research institute. MDI, I'm sure the Saul so we will talk more about that, and also you. UDRI, the Urban Development Research Institute, which is support, supported by Swedish government. But unfortunately, I cannot find any data. There's no, no, not much activities within, uh, in, uh, carried out by the UDRI, despite the fact that there's a big problem in urban area in Myanmar. Now, <clears throat> what are some of the opportunities I have talked about the institution, institutional uh, capacity now. Are there some opportunities there? I think there has been tremendous enthusiasm, high degree of enthusiasm, in cooperating with outside institutions. Many uh, researchers in the state uh, research institute or in NGO and in university are interested in doing research. Uh, both basic research and development research. They are keen to in, enter into the exchange program with, with the outside university. But as I mentioned, the IIE report brought, uh, IIE, uh, brought uh, uh, a number of professors from 10, 10 American universities and proposed a collaboration. But up to now, I heard that the the uh, proposal has not been accepted by the government. Uh, so it's become, it, 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 it's uh, very difficult to, to get uh, the memorandum of understanding or memorandum of agreement. Now, I heard that next week, uh, the, the Medical Research Institute will sign memorandum, memorandum of academic cooperation with Chiang University. Because if you do a member of agreement, you have to go to the cabinet. Now there are some uh, 
the proposed the need for uh, training on research methodology or proposal writing because there are lots of, of uh, money. That's the first scholarship come to Myanmar, but most people do not know how to write uh, uh, a, f uh, a successful uh, proposal or proposal with which gives funds. Okay. And I have uh, met several retired professors, former rectors of university, who, uh, who get together as a network of this retiree, the emeritus, who would like to engage in doing something about their own country, particularly using their own uh, knowledge of, in biology, in chemistry, in uh, uh, engineering, in fishery, in marine science, to work on uh, <coughs> some project. Like, for example, they are interested in doing research on the Salivin River, the whole Salivin, to look at to look at the uh, uh, fish species, the vegetation, the people who live and depends upon the Salim River. I, I've heard also that the, uh, there's another group of researchers involved in the study of the Irabadi. Now, that is the inside, uh, inside Myanmar. But I, I think uh, we also should talk about some opportunities inside Thailand, which is next to be Myanmar. There are several development programs uh, in, if you want to do development research, in actual University, MAIDS, at Chiang University, we also do, we have the development studies program, MA program, and at AIT, uh, Again, the uh, uh, IDLC provides a scholarship for students from, not only from Myanmar, but from the, from the uh, uh, GMS to study in, at, this, at this three development study program. And uh, of course, uh, uh, each year about 10 scholarship. Uh, and we, uh, we Myself is secretary for this uh, uh, program, so we allocate three to four scholarship to students from Myanmar to study in Thailand. And here, it's uh, those who come to study at Chula Chiang Mai OAD would get a basic training in social research <coughs> methodology, so that they can carry out uh, development study in when they are go when they are going back. Now, I think both Chuan University, Chiang Mai University, and EID has produced a large number of alumni who are capable of uh, doing research in this field. But most of them, uh, most of them are not, are not faculty members. Most of them work in NGOs. Uh, now, we also, we believe that if we want to build up this uh, uh, research capacity in Myanmar, we should start from the beginning, from the undergraduate level. That's why in, in Achimai Uni University, we have the BA program, international pro BA program in social science, and 80% of the students are from Myanmar, from Myanmar. So we would like to train them to know uh, social theory, to, to have a critical critical thinking on and also learn research methodology. And of course, good English. So that once they graduate, they can become, uh, either if, if they want to further their study at a uh, higher level, they can do, or they can become a research, a junior researcher in, in, back in their country if they are needed. Uh, another opportunity is also the fellowship that we have given, as the Mr. Ambassador told you at the beginning, ten scholarship, ten fellowship per year to researcher from Myanmar, and uh, Chiang Mai University has already implemented, has given, and has allocated uh, six scholarship, uh, six fellowship, sorry, to researcher from Myanmar. One of them from G ARI Agriculture Research Institute. One of them. Uh, from MRI Medical Research Institute, uh, and the rest are from to, from other people. How about need or what kind of uh, thematic areas that should be focused? I was told that uh, the 
the, the population of Myanmar is about 70, 70 million, right? 60 million. 70% of the people live in rural area, and most of them, if you don't know the percentage, depend, live and depend, live as well as all depends on their life upon forest. So the issue of the forests is very important for many, many people, particularly those who are in the Chin state, Kachin state, uh, Karin state, Omon state. And, and, uh, but, but, but uh, the, 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 the way the resource, the forest resource has been managed, it would be difficult for these poor people who live in this rural, rural poor community to be able to, to, to live in the forest or to depend upon the forest. Land grabbing has occurred uh, a lot in Myanmar. Uh, and of course, the, there will be dams in the Salin River and mining will going on. So these issues should be uh, one of the priority to, for, for research in Myanmar to focus upon. Second issue of food security livelihood strength of the rural poor. How can they survive within this rapid growing economy? Uh, how, of course, there will be a lot of money coming in, pouring into to Myanmar, but how this money will filter down, will trickle down to the rural poor, that's questionable. Would it be a more social privileges, more ethnic conflict, which come from uh, resource conflict or not, we do not know, but that ha it has to be done, has to be found out. Uh, about ethnic and religious conflict, and this is a major, a major problem. How can we, how Myanmar can create a multi, multi society, multi coexistent dif of people of different ethnic and religious background? How can this kind of a participatory development research can be carried out. Then another issue is about healthcare system. People, uh, as many of you know that many people from Myanmar fly to Thailand to come to Thailand's medical hub. Those are those who can fly. But those who cannot fly cross border to Metsot, to Metau Clinic. But those who cannot, those who do not live near the border, they have to borrow money uh, from the neighbor, from the kid, from the relative. One of uh, one of the fellow who received fellowship from ours, she carried out the study on catastrophic expenditure. I mean, the, the amount of ex health ex ex uh, medical expenses is very very high, and the result so far, she she told me that. They have to borrow money from neighbors or from relatives. Right. So the big uh, health issue is a big problem there. Then we also would like to look at the issue of community movement. How, how the when we have this open space, more social space, more more people can people can breathe. How local at different level can organize their own <coughs> network, their own organization, based upon their local knowledge, based upon their social network, to find ways and to find ways and mean and strategies in order to cope with the the the, <coughs> the changes that occur rapidly. How uh, religious and ethnic conflict can be resolved through this local movement. Local mo community, community movement is, is more or less like a social movement, but in a small scale. Yeah. Mm. Then it's about, it's about media. Social media is very popular in Myanmar, like in Thailand. So how this can provide public, public space for people in Myanmar to talk about, to learn about what is going on. I think in to promote development research or to promote research is not just giving money to researchers or who, those who are who would like to do to do research, but we need to provide the academic uh, environment so that people can discuss 
can use research to discuss about the problem, can learn from each other. I know that there are some scholars who have been trying to uh, set up not only uh, this kind of forum, but also journal, professional journal. If you, if Ajahn Didendan or some of our Thai colleagues here, remember in 19, late 1960, early 1970, in Thailand we had a first called, a, a journal called Journal of, Thai Journal of Social Science. It was, it was not only a journal, but it's also a platform, a, a, a forum where uh, social scientists who were trained from abroad came to discuss about that particular, the, the then political economic issues. And that led to the, of course, I think one of the factors led to uh, the formation of public intellectual in Thailand and also the student movement in the mid 70s and uh, the, the period after that. So there, there should be some kind of a uh, environment that can nurture research, a journal uh, of social science or a journal of development studies should be promoted, uh, more uh, workshop for a conference and forum. I know that now there is a journal, there are a revival of journal of Burmese studies. It's spearheaded by James Scott, not, not the late James C. Scott, but the current James Scott, who wrote about this, the art of the 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 the, 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 not, the art of not being governed, he is the one who start or revived this journal of Burmese study together with several uh, colleagues from Myanmar. That is good news. I hope that that kind of journal can be in more encouraged inside Burma and be written in also in Burmese language. Thank you very much. We've heard uh, some very micro details. This is on the ground um, uh, work on uh, capacity building, especially on uh, education and research. So very good, uh, John. Thank you very much. Uh, now we come to uh, Zhou. Zhou used to be at one point uh, like Ong Zhou, you know, like a lot of the friends and colleagues, uh, they're from the dissident community. For a long time, could not go back to Myanmar, uh, Burma, uh, since uh, 1990, right? So for years, uh, from the late 80s, they have been based uh, in Thailand. And at one time, Zhou was based here at ISIS Thailand. So uh, welcome back. And uh, he has been educated in the US, uh, at AU, at, uh, and also at Columbia. Uh, all the bios are available outside, and you, you can read the bios on your own. But what I want to ask Zhou, uh, like Ong Zhou, in a different way, uh, you know, you've seen a lot. Uh, you've seen a lot, a lot of persecution, couldn't go back, uh, having been having to be based outside your country, and now living in Yangon again, and going to Nepidaw, spending a lot of time in Nepidaw, setting up uh, with his colleagues, uh, initially I think it was Vahu, and you can talk about this, uh, uh, different NGOs uh, trying to promote development work, capacity building, and now culminating with this MDRI, Myanmar Development, Resource Institute. Uh, his colleague there, including uh, ANO, Ong Nang U, also has been a speaker with us in the past, and a uh, number, uh, number of people now doing development work, uh, indigenous uh, uh, development work. Uh, we're based in Thailand, and many have gone through, uh, have come through Jula. So, Zhou, uh, please go ahead and, and uh, say whatever you like, but uh, tell us a little bit about the, the feel on the ground of. Uh, you know, there have been just a lot of reforms. Do you think that, uh, is it too fast? Not enough? Uh, one. Second, uh, before you go into your talk, uh, just give us a sense of this violence that we're seeing in the news a lot. Is it really a religious violence in nature or is it ethnic in nature? Or is it half-half, exactly half-half? Please. Um, thank you, Jay. Um, it's really wonderful to be back in ISIS, and um, I owe a lot to this country, and then also particularly the Chula and also the Chimai University, which gave me a lot of opportunities to sustain as a researcher. Um, so if I may answer your questions, maybe I think I should um, also uh, share with you about the state of uh, research in the country. Um, maybe perhaps I think I should start uh, with my own personal story. Um, as um, Gwyn has said, um, it has been such a 
difficult case to work on, Burma of Myanmar before 2011, and which has been quite terrible for people like Aung and me uh, to not not to even mention about doing research. It's uh, even to assess data and information is very limited. So when I had a chance to go back to the country in 2011, it is a kind of a miracle. A miracle to be back in the country and to gain access to a lot of data and then to be able to use them in a very professional way and to contribute for the change process. So I think it's, it's to me, it's a personal miracle. And perhaps I would say, um, answer to your question about changes. In a way, I can describe the change itself is also a miracle. Because um, before 2010, no one could uh, imagine that uh, we could really start the transition and uh, go forward in the fashion that we are seeing right now. Um, so in, in a way, it was a miracle because the two leaders in one day met in Nejido, the President of Teng Sein and Dong San Suu Kyi. Uh, fortunately, they instantly forged a kind of a personal understanding. They spent the next uh, four or five hours to talk about all things uh, about changing the country. And that meeting actually triggered a lot of um, um, processes of change uh, across the country. Um, I was in Nijiro at the time. I, I'm quite, um, it was a memorable moment that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi came into the room full of uh, all the government officials and we were talking about uh, the topic that Aung San mentioned, the poverty reduction. So uh, um, she, she came to uh, listen to all the talks, the government uh, officials one after another spoke and um, then she went to see president and then then the next day we all, all learned that the meeting went very well so but then the whole thing happened after that so <clears throat> then um, doing research about uh, how did this change happen and why did it happen that's still uh, a big question mark for a lot of us uh, we because it's a very um, <clears throat> um, miracle in nature, so you can't really explain with all these theories and models and all that. So you, we did have a wonderful transition in 2011. And because the transition is also coming from the very, um, at the very human level, uh, of course, it's very importantly at the two, um, <clears throat> Um, very good leaders. Uh, one f uh, from been the, um, one of the former leaders of the military regime, and one has been the democracy icon. The rest of the the situations, uh, as uh, Jan Chayan has uh, correctly described, all the structural conditions uh, surrounding the transition is rather unchanged. <clears throat> so I think this is this is uh, one of the challenges for researchers like us uh, where to start. So we are, <clears throat> apart from the leadership who are who have the who have committed strong political will to cooperate and really uh, <clears throat> charter the transition and the structural conditions, um, uh, the agency problems are abound, and on top of that because our leaders are very committed so they want the comprehensive reform so we are talking about transition not just from the former centrally uh, administered um, military dominated political system to a more pluralistic democratic society we are also talking about uh, prolonged <coughs> um, civil war which has been fighting many years and um, all across the countries uh, involving the central government and uh, many uh, dozens of ethnic minorities and nationality groups. Uh, we are also trying to uh, succeed in the transition from war to peace. And when it comes to economy, it is even more challenging. It is 
Uh, we are talking about the 60 years of um, uh, state domination and centrally planned, uh, very hierarchical structures, and we have t um, had experience about 25 years of uh, socialist rule from 1962 to 88, and from 88 until 2011, it was uh, military uh, dominated. Um, it, it, it was a kind of a, a transition to market, but it is much more the military dominated state capitalism type of economy. Then now uh, we are trying to move away from that and towards more pluralistic uh, market dominated uh, economic transition. So this is a kind of a triple transition where Myanmar is trying to overcome all these structural and human uh, uh, resource uh, shortcomings. So <clears throat> then um, in the middle of that um, very, very serious uh, limitations, uh, a group of us were able to go back to the country and then um, we were um, working under our mentor, uh, Dr. Wu Mian, and who also uh, accidentally became the chief advisor to the uh, president. And then he was our mentor for many years before that he was actually guiding us uh, from inside the country to sustain our own interests in doing research uh, about our own country. So he was able to call back and then, um, and then we actually uh, uh, able to start this MDRI. And then the name MDRI, it's not accident that we picked the MDRI because we have uh, inspiring examples of the DDRI. And then uh, I think Jam Siamwala has been a friend to our economists, uh, Dr. Mien and, uh, and Dr. Finlay and Dr. Lan and Tom. So, so I think um, talking about the research, um, we have huge uh, problems, not just on the supply side and the demand side, also about the mechanism bridging between the two. Uh, the, these are all weaknesses around the entire change of uh, linking research to policy. So on the, on the supply side, I think Jan Chan has already mentioned about uh, dearth of the research institutions uh, which can actually do the research, the dearth of data. Uh, the data has been uh, not just inaccessible, it's uh, in many ways data is lacking. And then um, uh, whatever the data we had, it was uh, driven by the very much the political biases that Tom saw mentioned. So it is very much politically driven um, data, which uh, try to justify whatever the the previous government claimed as a uh, development. So I think this is this is a very serious situation where we are in in terms of um, um, supplying uh, data and research to those who may want to use them. Um, and th so <clears throat> the government indeed uh, has given the data collection and the improving the data system as a one of the four priority economic objectives of the country. So maybe we are the only country that uh, dare mention about improving the data system as a one of the four pillars of our economic policy objectives. I think this is how it is serious. So um, you can, if you if you work into the, the the halls of the Ministry of Planning, I think you will see that uh, uh, objective uh, clearly say in a big uh, bolded uh, letters. And so uh, the government is quite committed to improve the data because um, this is when where um, with the the changes in the political arena has taken uh, such a strong momentum forward. The, the rest of the changes on the peace building and then all the economic part has also uh, followed that uh, very quickly. So uh, at, at least on the economic side, I can uh, confidently say that there are a lot of uh, government institutions who really want to 
do uh, analyses and try to present to the leaders that what is possible and what is not. So there's a huge demand on part of the government institutions which really wanted to uh, improve the data system. So I think this is part of the reason that some of, the, some of these leaders were able to put that uh, objective as a, uh, uh, the, one of the four pillars of uh, economic policy objective in the country. And another <coughs> interesting uh, development uh, which is also helping the demand side is the emergence of the parliament. Uh, of course, the parliament, there was a 2011 parliament which was uh, uh, dominated by a single party. But uh, with thanks to the by-elections, then we had the uh, opposition, the National League for Democracy, and Aung San Suu Kyi herself now sitting in the parliament. And then all of a sudden, the parliament is a real parliament which is now trying to uh, play a major role in checking and try to balancing the views uh, with vis-a-vis uh, -vis with the government who is also implementing very comprehensive reforms. So the parliament has, uh, <coughs> it's, it's previously many people thought that it was, it would be just a rubber stamp parliament. Uh, nowadays, the, if you actually watch the parliamentary sessions, um, and then the, it was a live coverage in the local TV, and then you, you will see a lot of uh, the parliamentarians standing up and using a lot of data and information to push their arguments across, and then it really uh, sometimes setting a, a very awkward position for the government officials to come back with uh, and answering many of these uh, answers. So that that's parliament uh, is really uh, <coughs> uh, mobilizing uh, a lot of need for more uh, information and evidence-based discussions and arguments. And then, of, of course, what where the parliament is getting uh, these information. Uh, they got uh, information right from the media, which is also another fascinating uh, development. Uh, the media has been, uh, <coughs> it's also uh, developing very fast. And now we, are, we have like 11 daily papers really uh, competing for the market. And maybe I think this is, again, Myanmar is the only country where the 11, uh, the, 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 even though you, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, capitalists and uh, connected uh, business uh, corporations who wanted to set up these media outlets. But nevertheless, it was a quite fiercely competitive market. And maybe it's this day and time of the you know social media and internet. Uh, I, I would uh, 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 appre appreciate the willingness on part of the the money uh, owners to really invest in the in the dailies. So we have eleven papers, which are now printing every day to feed uh, a lot of information, and then they, they try to be very competitive, and I think this is where we are seeing a lot of uh, diversity of uh, suppliers uh, of information, and then there's an ample uh, group of people um, uh, within the parliament and then the government who is monitoring what the press is talking about, their performances, and really responding and try to get ahead of the game. So I think these are the <clears throat> wonderful opportunities that have uh, come up. But uh, nevertheless, uh, definitely I must admit that uh, there, there's a, uh, inherent structural problems uh, <clears throat> uh, facing both <clears throat> supply and then the demand side of <clears throat> the research deliveries and research uptake. <clears throat> then, be between the two sides, the demand and supply, where are the mechanisms and the structures linking between the two, the supply and demand? This is where I think uh, Jan Chai has emphasized a lot on the research institutes. Um, and then my institute is just um, a very new organization just established in 2011. Um, uh, ours is a, a very independent think tank. Uh, we work very closely with the government, but um, we don't 
take uh, any uh, money uh, from the government so that we can actually produce independent uh, research and then also provide uh, independent and second opinion to the government policymakers. Um, so I think uh, there are not too many of us in this whole vacuum. Um, even though there are a lot of, um, there's a quite um, a possibility that there will be many uh, suppliers and then there will be a lot of demand, uh, both from the government, the parliament, and then also the lastly uh, from the international development partners. But we have a very limited numbers of uh, those the people and then also the institution that can link between the two. So I think probably I think this should be the highest priority for the development partners to be able to support some of these institutions which can um, prioritize a lot of uh, <coughs> our needs and try to link these needs with both suppliers and demand side of the equation. So how we are surviving under all these pressures? Uh, let me give you a few examples of what we do as a researchers and then also the think tank people uh, at this MDRI. Um, when we, we had a chance uh, not just to gain access to the data, but uh, at one point we were also given the opportunity to use them and analyze them and try to present some policy uh, opinions and inputs to the government. Of course, we took it in a big way. Um, the reason that we did it, uh, because um, as I said, everything else is in a very challenging situation. Nothing is very rosy. It's everything looks very bleak as the 10 Americans that you rightly uh, analyze. So we have to prioritize and provide the kind of a services that can make at least the forward moving process cannot go back. So I think this is the first priority. I think our mentor has um, uh, reminded us and that we are still in a very fragile transition. So everything what we can do in the very early stages to make the uh, transition uh, have the very little chance of uh, being reversible. So we took on the assignment to help the, the government to formulate the reform strategy, the overall reform strategy, uh, what we call the, the framework for economic and social reform. Uh, which we work with um, about 300 senior officials from the government um, and uh, a few researchers from my institute try to uh, uh, mobilize a lot of inputs from the government side and then then we actually gone back and start consulting many of the NGOs and civil society organizations uh, then we try to also take input and feedback from the civil society uh, well, we were able to do that, uh, do, uh, do play, play, play that role because uh, I used to be the, um, <coughs> the director of the center at the Chiang Mai University. I think Jan Chai and, and then uh, uh, Jan, um, many professors from Chiang Mai University gave us a wonderful opportunity to walk out of Chiang Mai University to train many NGOs, leaders, uh, starting from 2006. We already have trained about 500 um, community leaders and uh, NGO managers. So we were able to tap into these networks quickly and then try to get a lot of feedback from uh, these networks and try to come up with this uh, framework for economic and social reform. Um, fortunately, we were able to convince the, 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 <coughs> the leaders of the government that, that we need an overall, research, overall reform framework in order to convince the donors that we are moving ahead uh, with a lot of uh, priorities which if the, the international donor community can help and if we implement them, then we will have uh, at least uh, kind of a, the traction on the, our transitional process. So we were able to get the pr president approval in December. So it was uh, adopted as uh, the government um, uh, 
overall reform strategy, and 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 uh, then it was also uh, we were able to rally the international development partners to come to Myanmar in January, uh, which uh, we got the huge response uh, uh, from many uh, 20 governments and about uh, uh, 20, uh, another 20 or 30 international organizations which came to Napier together in January to adopt this as a, a kind of a reference framework where the international donor community will channel the resources and we will implement them. So I think that was uh, one <coughs> um, project that we were able to contribute. If I may just reflect on what how we did it, it was not nothing fancy. It was a very basic research that uh, you have emphasized, and then because we are we are the last men in ten Southeast Asian nations, so in order to uh, get out of that position and to become number nine and number eight, which is not a uh, rocket science, it's a very basic thing that we have to do. So we try to to learn a lot from others' transition. So I think this is where we just do the basic research, try to understand the other lessons of reform, and we try to contextualize these lessons, and we try to look at where we are, and then try to provide a very simple recommendation where we can start. So I think that's how we did uh, in uh, formulating the framework for economic and social reform. Um, then I, <clears throat> the next interesting thing that we uh, took up, another assignment is uh, we were uh, pushing a lot on this natural resource uh, dependency, which we thought that as a real challenge for our transition. We've been very much dependent on natural resources. Also, it's also a big, very uh, important issue for Myanmar and Thailand, uh, where we are supplying a lot of uh, natural gas to Thailand, and Thailand is using uh, uh, our uh, energy resources. Likewise, we are now starting to sell a lot of these resources to China, India, and the, we are all surrounded by energy-hungry country, and then we have a lot of these resources. So I think the conditions are all there to really uh, deepen our dependency on these resources. And it is a very tempting for the government to use all these uh, revenue and being complacent about how we can achieve uh, some uh, better development outcomes. So I think this is another, uh, to, to, uh, for a researcher like us, I think this is a real uh, challenge that we must overcome. So we took the assignment as the national coordinator for what we call the Internet uh, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. The EITI is, uh, is started by the British, um, uh, the British leaders, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair, and a few European countries and try to help the resource rich countries in the Africa and they're now becoming, fast becoming a kind of an international standard. Uh, recently, the, both uh, UK, France, and United States, and Australia all pledged to become a member. So it's becoming a global standard, in which uh, the president actually committed to be part of the EITI. And then we were uh, trying to help <coughs> this process from the very technical, uh, uh, as to be a technical coordinator, because the EITI is a, is a kind of a uh, neat technical solution which we try to reach all the very pressing policy issues like resource dependency, revenue mobilization, and then also the, the importance of the central bank and finance minister to be the coordinator of the major reforms, things like that. So <clears throat> we took that challenge and then just last week uh, we had a delegation uh, from Yama uh, headed towards Sydney, and then we we had 23 members of delegation. We have uh, seven uh, government officials headed by the two senior ministers. One is the finance and the mining, and then we have a uh, 13 civil society uh, representatives, including uh, one uh, political uh, former political prisoner. Actually, he is our colleague from the 88th generation student leader. 
and then we have uh, uh, several ethnic representatives who came from the resource rich countries and then we also have uh, a few ca academics like me and then some geoscientists who were very much wanted to contribute so we were able to uh, collectively uh, launch a uh, pledge that will become the EITI member by end of the year. So the, the next six months will be very busy uh, trying to collect a lot of information about the natural resources and try to work with this, both civil society and all these um, the ministries and ministers to be able to agree on the strategy that we will present it to the EITI secretariat. So a lot of people, actually many countries use EITI as a way to boost their investment attractiveness. So many uh, resource rich countries in the former Soviet Union and the many countries in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So they try to uh, be part of the EITI so that they can get the good labor and then they can attract uh, high, they can get the high investment grading and then they can attract many investors. Uh, of course, we are not in that league. We are truly committed by the president and we have what we call the champions uh, who are uh, from the, the president office ministers who are really guiding the process. And the president actually committed to this process because he also thinks that by acquiring international standards, by bringing the international partners to help us, then he should be able to use these resources to push the domestic reforms. Uh, well, Alonso always mentioned about many of the ministries. Uh, I think his characterization sometimes, it, it's, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, he's talking about a lot of truth. Um, I think that is even truer for many of our ministries which control very rich natural resources because they are very powerful. They are talk, they, these are the, the ministry that generate the whole lot of revenue in under the time when we don't have any development assistance, we don't have any investment, so they are the ones who generate the money that sustain the past previous regime. So they were very powerful, so they are very reluctant to share information. And the EITI was uh, committed by the president. Through the EITI, he was able to uh, force many ministries to share information and then now a lot of data are coming out from the Ministry of Energy website. You can actually go and check and then uh, the, the new round of concessions, a lot of information are shown uh, in their websites about how the international investors can assess to these very com complicated uh, investment opportunities. They are all on the website thanks to the EITI process. So I think this is this is where, we're, where it's a very small window of opportunity if you can uh, use it carefully and try to link all these resources, all the energies offering to us from the outside, then we can have a very important impact on our domestic reform. So I think this is um, 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 a kind of how the very technical, very uh, a lot of data, a lot of uh, hard work of research can influence big policy outcomes. And the third one, the last one I wanted to share with you is about, and with, with the FESI and EITI, now we are deeply involved in a lot of these processes. And then, and then the president actually called for the third wave of reforms he, he needed very urgently. So we had this political reform, the first stage, the economic and social reform, second stage, which we delivered for the reform strategy. And then still a lot of um, <coughs> the, the political will, the, the policy guidance from the top do not really flow uh, smoothly and fastly and quickly enough along the bureaucratic channels. So now we are quite st stuck in what we call the implementation nightmares. Yeah, a lot of uh, challenges we are talking about is 
most of these ideas, the policy directives, and help and input from the international development partners are not realized into the actions and not uh, quick enough to generate the benefits from for the for the people on the ground. So I think this is exactly what uh, Oh, Dong San Suji has been uh, reminding us. Uh, there were a lot of reforms, initiatives, but there are very little results on the ground, which is true, because we don't really have the mechanisms, structures, and processes that can translate policies into the actions and then the outcomes and the impact. So I think this is where uh, the, the the president introduced uh, what we call the public administrative reforms, a governance reform. So, uh, well, again, we were also seeing that as a, a challenge, but at the same time, it is a necessity and very urgent priority. So, we our institute also uh, tried to help with that process, and then what. Uh, uh, the government has uh, just formed is uh, what it is called the public uh, service performance appraisal task force. Uh, the Queen has nicely <laughs> written about that uh, task force in one of her uh, feature article, and I'm uh, very um, glad that she picked up on that news because this is a little task force. It's a uh, uh, nameless, but uh, we've been trying very hard to. Uh, push around the bureaucracy to generate quick wins. And uh, we are also linking that mechanism to a lot of uh, public complaints mechanisms. So in a way we are serving is as a kind of a ombudsman, the kind of a ombudsman for the ongoing reforms and then try to uh, channel a lot of feedbacks from the ground. And w we were able to do some, uh, able to grab some low-hanging fruits. For example, like uh, if you dare to apply for the Burmese passport next time, you won't uh, find uh, even um, the time that you take for the visa here. The, the, the passports are now being issued within a month, within a week. It used to be like a two, three months of process. That is uh, hindering a lot of uh, challenges for the citizens to gain uh, the passport. It's a very costly, very time consuming, it has to go through several steps, several offices, then they have to wait for at least two to three months. And then we try to review a lot of these um, steps and try to just basically question those who are in charge of the, the, the signatures. So you need a lot of like uh, maybe two dozen signatures is needed to apply <laughs> the passport. And then we try to ask them uh, why you were asked to do sign it, and at least half of them don't know the answer. <laughs> we don't know, and we were just asked to sign it. And so then, if you don't know, then don't sign it. And so I think that's how we were able to reduce a lot of these steps. And now I think there were only uh, two, three steps needed, and then then you get the passwords within seven to 14 days. So pr promise time is 14 days, but a lot of people are getting passwords within seven to 10 days. So I think this is where we were trying to get um, some results. But again, all these examples, uh, nice examples, but we are just talking about low hanging fruits. Uh, there's a huge, uh, we are talking about the, uh, tip of the iceberg where the huge entrance structure and human resource problems lying ahead of us and which will haunt us to succeed our reforms. So I think, um, <clears throat> so this is a serious problem. So we were able to um, get traction on the reform process. The next will be a much challenging. The, we will need all the help uh, from <clears throat> international donors. Of course, we will always turn to our neighbors for help. We've been receiving a lot of wonderful help in the past and then we will come to Thailand and to get um, effective cooperation, learn the lessons from your cases. I think the Southern issue Jay has uh, uh, put it uh, in detail. My colleague women 
he is now back as a senior research fellow. He actually tried to uh, learn the lessons from the Southern uh, conflict. And so we are learning a lot from you, indeed. And then uh, uh, we are also trying to understand uh, some of the very deep-seated conflicts. So <clears throat> your question about the Rohingya, if I may just, it would take another day to discuss the whole issue. So it is not a simple matter of uh, anti-Muslim, <laughs> when you have accidentally slipped your tongue, I know you are not uh, into that league. But unfortunately, many those from outside are using very simple uh, way of describing our conflicts. This is anti-Muslim, anti-Buddhist. It's very easy to, but underneath that uh, simple label, there were a lot of deeply entrenched issues. We are talking about um, years of history, um, co colonial rule, which uh, talking about the border demarcations, uh, bringing the labor from the labor abundant country to the resource rich country like ours, um, talking about the bilateral relations. No one has mentioned a single reference to Bangladesh, you know, if we are asking about the Koreans living for many decades to gain the citizenship of Thailand, it will be an outlandish burst of reactions from many of you. But of course, uh, the government of Myanmar and many of us don't think that's the right way of demanding it. We are quite willing to take back. Uh, if you look at uh, the way that we have now uh, dealing with the migrant workers issues, we took the responsibility, the minister and many delegations came, actually uh, two delegations uh, is coming to try to resolve a lot of issues. We are really uh, trying to uh, help the migrant workers. We uh, recognize them as our fellow citizens who were unfortunately had to find the greener pastures for their survival and now is a uh, time for us to help them and maybe perhaps in the future we may be able to tap these resources back in our emerging industries and once the Japanese investors and Thai investors move to us and then they will be become the the main uh, bridging uh, mechanism for a lot of human resource gaps. So we, we took it seriously to take and help them and then if uh, possibly in the future to take them back. But the same approach cannot be taken when we talk about the, the Rohingya's issues. So I think this is, this is where uh, we are also talking about the bilateral issues. We are talking about the resource issues. If you if you take the political economy prism, there uh, many of these um, uh, working relationship between the Rakhine and uh, Rohingya and some Bengalese uh, migrants coming recently. There were a lot of uh, symbiotic relationship in the past, and um, because Rakhine is still a very resource rich areas where our population is quite sparse, and that we need a lot of help. And then that's how the communities live uh, side by side for a long time. And uh, many uh, <coughs> uh, Muslim communities in other parts of the country, like uh, in uh, Shan State, in the middle of our country, also has lived side by side. Uh, but unfortunately, um, this uh, conflict has flared up. And so I don't think that uh, solution for this uh, very deep-seated problem is just about interfaith or interreligious uh, kind of mediation. It has to be holistic, very comprehensive. We need a lot of help from a lot of many uh, helping hand to address uh, on the multiple front. So uh, situation lying ahead of us, <laughs> as uh, Jan Chan has uh, quoted uh, from uh, uh, the American institutions, it's quite uh, bleak. But what is promising is there are a lot of people uh, who are waiting 
there to, to grab all these helping hands and try to make a difference. I think on that note, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you.